Okay, hello everyone. This is Counter Yolo again, bringing you another video in Star Trek Online. And in today's video, we're going to be talking about the two new Romulan legendary starships that are really seen in about a week or so: the new legendary Scimitar and the new legendary Dideridex. Um, going into that, we'll be going over the, those two ships separately, and we'll go through the old stuff that comes with them, and then their two new starship traits. Then there'll be a TLDW at the end, per usual. Feel free to see the time links in the description or at the time bar at the bottom of the screen. And with that, we will go ahead and get started. Um, as as for the bundle itself, um, it is two legendary starships in one st in one bundle. It is still 12k Zen like regular for regular normal one starship legendary bundles. The difference is that it's not going to be 50% off to start off with. Instead, it's just 35% off. If I did the math right, and I could have done the math wrong. Please correct me in the comments if I am incorrect on this. Um, if I did, did the math right, it's around 7,800 Zen. Um, I was personally expecting the bundle to be to be 15K Zen, so that 50% off would be 7,500. But they did 35% off with 12K for, for the same price. They added some extra stuff alongside the two legendary ships. For me, it doesn't matter, but I have copy and pasted from, from the blog the extra stuff here if you want to read through that. Most of the stuff can either be earned in the game or is decently cheap in, in, in the C-Store. So not particularly things that I consider personally worthwhile. Looking at the pricings though, the big things they're going to carry this pack honestly is going to be the Scimitar stuff that you get from it. Because if you're wanting all the skins from all the old Scimitars in one bundle, um, and wanting all the old consoles from the, from the old Scimitars, the tier 5 Scimitar pack is 5k Zen not on sale, and the tier 6 Scimitar pack is 6k Zen not on sale. So that by itself, those two things combined would be 11,000 Zen. So if those things are things that you're already considering and you don't have the, the tier 6 Scimitar pack yet, and we're considering getting a tier 6 Scimitar, this might be tempting for you. If you're someone that already owns all that stuff, this might be a hard sell for you, you to buy this bundle. Just going to throw that out there. Also, keep in mind, um, they have already adjusted the stats of the Legendary to Dideridex because it was already very lackluster and worse than the old Miracle Worker Warbirds. The stats they, they changed didn't really change the ship all that much, and we will get into that. They could very easily change the starships drastically before release, and I do hope that they do and that they watch this video and realize that they really should. Um, I actually think the Scimitar is fine. The Dideridex has issues though. Um, with that, we'll go ahead and get into the Dideridex. Now, when we get into this, just as a preface, this is what battle cruisers normally give you. Um, in, in its Starship Mastery package, you sacrifice the HP regen per three seconds for an extra 15% crit severity. You get access to dual cannons and you, you just lose one of the cruiser commands, command distract fire. And you still have the other three. So for DPS builds, that's not really much of an issue. You're totally fine with losing HP regen and you can track fire to get an extra 15% crit severity and access to dual cannons. No, no issues there. Here's the problem with Warper battle cruisers. You lose the cruiser commands, you have lower power levels, and you're losing that 15% crit severity for a singularity circuitry to let your singularity core power up faster. This is not good. And this is why for, for most players, they might not even realize this whenever they're trying to fly a Dideridex for the first time, but they're gonna realize, oh, this ship feels weird. It's doing less damage than I was expecting. It's much less maneuverable. And this is partly why. You have lower power levels. You don't have the crit severity that you're expecting from a battle cruiser for the, your war battle battlecruisers. And you don't have cruiser commands, so that lower turning feels even worse. So when I when I saw Legendary Dideridex and it's not going to have a hangar bay, I'm like, okay, obviously they're going to be adding something super, super strong to this starship to make it really OP to counteract the fact that we're not going to have the, the and now we're not going to have crit severity in the mastery package, and we're not going to have cruiser commands and not and no hangar bay. And what do we get? We got basically a standard of, of, of the mill Miracle Worker Starship. 
but no creature commands. And to say that I'd be disappointed would be pretty kindly. Now, granted, they have added something new to this in that you've ha we have an extra temporal seat alongside Miracle Worker, which actually is a callback to the Thry, and we'll get to, to that later. Um, and they did mention on the live stream that the moment that they made, made the Miracle Worker Warbirds, they were like, yeah, we know that if we make a Legendary to Deradex, we will make a Miracle Worker. Okay. If they already had that established and they wanted to have a callback to the Thry, Miracle, Miracle Worker plus Temporal makes sense. Having this Temporal seat on the Tactical seat and the only Lieutenant Commander Tactical on the Starship really limits the Starship. You're either basically going to be ignoring the Temporal seat altogether, or you're going to, like, the only way that I see this actually working is if you do an Exceeded Ready Limits build on this ship. Exceeded Ready Limits plus Recursive Shearing with that Lieutenant Commander um, Temporal ability. This would, have been, this would have been much more interesting if the, if the temporal seat was was on the was on the science seat instead of tactical, because then you could have still done like, like like you still you still could have done like like a beam overload build with recursive shearing and, and do miracle worker fun stuff alongside it. As presented, the only realistic thing that I see having this ship standing out versus all the other catalog of starships right now is accelerated limits plus recursive shearing one. Outside of that. From a, from a mechanical standpoint, I don't see a reason to fly this ship. Now, it is still the, the, the Deradex, and there are people that are going to still want this ship because of that. And if you're just doing a plain weapons build, is this an improvement over the old fleet of the Deradex? Sure, as long as you weren't caring about torpedoes. If you want, if you want a pair of weapons build, this is a bit more flexible and it's bridge off your CD. And you can just, just ignore the temporal and just get the extra universal console for it. So if that's what you want, then this is an improvement. And they did buff its turning because people were, were complaining about this ship versus the old Miracle Worker Warbirds, and, and rightly so. Um, and keep in mind, especially if you're someone who's gonna be doing a lot of, of alt characters with, with, with themes, this um, fleet, the did, did Ardex, requires tier four military, and the Hopax, which is a, might be a little bit better fleet um, Warbird, requires tier five military. So these ships are not necessarily the easiest ships to come by when it comes to, to access for a lot, a lot of, of the player base. Yes, there's some people that um, can easily get invited to fleets and if you wanna put in the effort to get invited to a fleet just to buy a ship, you can ask around and within a few hours you can generally find somebody. I have done that for a few characters. That being said, it's not necessarily the easiest for a lot of player, the player base that likes to just, you know, just solo uh, random TFO types of things and get to tier six reps with those. The reason why we have tactical temporal um, on the Legendary Day Deradex is, is, is a callback to the lockbox Thry. Keep in mind, prior to the Legendary Day Deradex, the, the, the Thry Dreadnought Warbird was the only premium um, the Deradex that we had inside the game. And as we can see here, this ship has a hangar bay and it has, has a 5 3 weapon layout, which is interesting. Considering how old this ship is, it's also got a respectable hull. It is technically a smidget lower than the than the fleet version, if as we can see here, but it has meaningfully higher turn. It still has like same bad inertia, but it's meaningfully improved on, on its turn compared to the legendary Dark, which is still lagging in that department. Still a bit faster than this ship, but this ship is much better at at turning overall. Um, now, yes, Tackle Temporal Engineering Command is still going to be kind of hard to use on this ship. But at least you've got better maneuverability. And I, I think that's why why you, you, would, you would, back in the day, still occasionally still see this ship flying around. Nowadays, this is really hard to find just because the Atlas is such a higher prized Dreadnought Cruiser. And... If you have the probability to actually get a tier six infinity box, you'll choose the Atlas over the ship any day because of the DPRM console and how much other people value that. I definitely see, see the Thry within the next 12 months showing up in MUD's market for sure and in, 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 in a bundle, probably with the D9 as well. I don't know if, if the Atlas would show up with it as well, but who knows, the Cryptic might be considering that too. 
um, for a meaningful improvement over this, even though it is 4.4. I really like the Vastum. It's not a ship that I really talk about too much on, on the channel, just because there are other command ships that I prefer, especially from, from the fleet. But for a Warbird, it's, it's, it's not bad. You still have Commander Command, so you can still do fun tor torpedo stuff with this thing. Um, you don't have anything awkward on the Lieutenant Commander Tactical, and it's still maneuverable. You do have a lower hull, but you get, but you don't have the, the super awful turning that the old um, Didard Exes and such had. Now, comparing to the really old stuff, because of course we are, I think I probably typed some of this wrong here, but um, we have the old Legendary Galaxy, which I still feel is one of the worst Legendary Starships in, in, in the game. And one of them I like to pretend doesn't doesn't really exist in the game. And um, I think part of the reason why the stats of the Adaris were initially a little bit lower was, was to be more comparable to the Legendary Galaxy. Which I'm glad they have buffed this ship because the Galaxy was never really a good ship to begin with. The 10th Anniversary Bundle sold well because of the other ships in the bundle, not because of the Galaxy. People still fly the Galaxy because... TNG is one of the best Star Trek shows in, the, um, in, in existence, So, and the Galaxy is that I iconic ship. The Sovereign is a bit better of a starship and has some interesting things about, uh, versus the, the Derridex. If you're wanting more damage, the Sovereign is definitely the way to go. Now, I did notice on Reddit before making this video, so I decided to add this slide. Uh, there are people trying to argue that the reason why Tactical Temporal is on the Lieutenant Bar Tactical seat is because, oh, it's supposed to be a pseudo-science um, cruiser. And so you're able to have, you know, six science abilities. If you make the universal here science, and you can, you can make the entire Tactical seat into Temporal. Okay, I can see that. But we have a fleet starship. And a starship from the 10th anniversary legendary bundle that are both better than that. We have we have the Fleet Narendra, also known as the, the Fleet Ambassador class, which has similar base stats to the, the, the Daredex, but it's more maneuverable. And you're able to have six science abilities. Plus, you can have the entire um, commander and engineering seat into temporal, which also gives you molecular reconstruction. So you have that to help you out as well. If you want to go even more extreme than that, you can go to the 10th anniversary bundle and get the legendary discovery temporal flight deck carrier, which gives you all of that plus two hangar bays, and you have the option to go for even more temporal abilities if if you wish, for more of the entry mechanics of the build in, into the ship as well. Um, especially with without an access to a secondary deflector, um, the entry mechanic is a great way to go. Um, if, if you want to do reasonable damage on a starship without using your weapons and again with two hangar bases to, to support what you're doing with this this is a great ship if you're going to go that route it's still this is still a great ship if you want to just do a, a pure weapons build um, with with recursive shearing it's still a great platform for that if you want to tank it's still a great platform for that too but it, it can also do that quite well and especially considering the recent legendary bundle sale i know a lot of people went and splurged and got the 10th anniversary legendary bundle and, and so if you have that bundle this for a science cruiser is just going to be very much lacking versus either of these options here that's just my opinion though it is true that we don't want to, we don't have something like this for a warbird so if you want to slightly subpar warbird in that type of vein of thought that is technically an option and of course we get to the miracle worker warbirds that were released years ago at this point now, when we get to the stats here, you, you'll notice with the buff stats for the Dideridex, it finally has comparable maneuverability to the old Merrick Worker Warbirds, and has a smidget, not much, but a smidget higher durability. That being said, if you don't care about the tactical temporal seat of how you would realistically probably build the Dideridex, it is realistically just a reskinned version of the science Merrick Worker Warbird. And keep in mind, you can get the Science Miracle Worker, Worker Warbird looks and just fly the, the Tactical Miracle Worker Warbird that gets an extra Tactical Console. And has, in my opinion, probably a better bridge off your seating for what a lot of players are going to do with, with a broadsiding Miracle Worker, Worker build. Just going to throw that out there. Yes, if, if you want a gravity well to make it easier, this is still fine. Um, but a lot of players will prefer the Tactical version because of the extra Tactical Console. I can definitely see that. 
In comparison though, if we venture it's a little bit outside of our comfort zone and go beyond Warbirds, we have the Tactical Cruisers. Tactical Merkwork Cruisers from, from that same bundle, which, guess what? The Tactical, ver the, the Klingon Tactical version, hmm, has the exact same hold and shields as the Dideridex, but it also has Cruiser Commands in lieu of, of, of dual cannons. So, is this really that substantially better? That is for you to decide. I still think that, you know, for a 3K Zen Starship versus trying to buy a, a legendary bundle, I think this is a perfectly fine Starship. And of course, if you want to go to the fleet, the Mirror Worker Battle Cruisers that also, the Clan version also gets a Battle Cloak too, and Battle Cruiser Commands, and access to dual cans as well, and a 5 3 layout versus the 4 4 of the Dideridex. If, if you're wanting that type of play style, I think the Mirror Worker Battle Cruisers are still completely fine to use, use instead, and are quite a bit cheaper. And of course, I'm going to include these other two Merrick Worker ships here from Promo Packs. I'm not a big fan of the Inquiry, but I know a lot of people are. Um, it does have flexible seating. Um, as long as you're, you're okay with using a Photonic Officer for your, for your setup. The, the, the Promo D7 Merrick Worker flight they carry is, is a great tanking platform that does reasonably well for other playstyles too. All right. Um, with that said, let's go to the Scimitar now. Um, now, like the Dideridex, um, the Scimitar has some slightly different modifications to its to its stats versus what its other regular subclass features would normally be. Now, when you consider escorts and strike point escorts, they ha they generally have the exact same mastery package: accuracy, defense, extra energy damage, and crit crit chance. And they have less maneuverability to get that hangar bay. Now. What Strike Wing Warbirds and Dreadnought Warbirds do is that, is that they get rid of the defense to give you that singularity circuitry, which, and a little bit lower power levels, plus that singularity core. Compared to what Warbird Battle Cruisers are doing to Battle Cruisers, this, this is fine. This is not really that huge of a deal. It's more of just the lower power levels, is what people are going to feel whenever they're playing a Strike Wing Warbird or a Dreadnought Warbird when it comes to the comparisons here. The big difference, though, for a Dreadnought Warbird is that. You're basically getting this master package from a Strike Wing Warbird, but you're having the rough durability and maneuverability of a Juggernaut. So that is kind of what the Scimitars now basically are. Now keep in mind, since the Scimitars existed prior to the Juggernaut subclass actually technically being invented, which is why in my Star Star Subclasses Explained video, I do consider Scimitars part of the Juggernaut subclass. Even though technically they don't have the mastery package of, of that subclass and they have a and they have a hangar bay instead of the juggernaut array, for me personally, and how people practically build and fly the um some scimitars, they are functionally like the juggernaut subclass. When we look at at the stats for, for the legendary scimitar, um the hole and shields have gone up a smidget as well as its turning. And what they have basically done to its bridge i've seen it is, is, is added a lot of flexibility this i feel is to help appeal to both play styles that the scimitars really appeal towards the tactical version was much more damage focused and it's five tactical consoles but at the same time there are people like, like like me that loved the engineering version of the old scimitar because i was able to have lieutenant Commander engineering plus a lieutenant commander command seat so i could have a virtual priority 2 plus um suppression barrage one and with this starship i in, with the legendary version i can still do that exact same build I, I just have to have two engineering seats instead of just one so there is definitely that um to, to make that play style work that being said um would the build actually change for me personally not really. Um, you can go ahead and see my old build for how, how I made my Plasma Scimitar um, back at the end, end of last year, my tanking in the Tier 6X era video, and you could really port that build straight on, onto this one and you'd be able to do the exact same thing. Um, with that being said, let's just go ahead and get, go into the stats here. Again, um, DPS captains are probably going to get the biggest benefit out of this change because now they, they can have an extra Lieutenant Commander Tactical Bridge offer seat um, that's not being um, filled up with with command abilities because 
with the legendary scimitar, you've got a second lieutenant commander seat that you, you can use on, on command builds instead of engineering if you so choose. Keep in mind, um, some of your your energy weapon based builds are probably going to still just use this lieutenant commander engineering seat for just ox to bat plus merge part of weapons and then the ensign seat for merge part of engines. Then the rest of this will just be tactical abilities from there. Which means, again, the big, the, on the really the biggest benefit from, from this change is going to be that DPS captains get an extra ability to use for offense because they, they don't have a wasted science ability. With the old version, you would um, a lot of people would, would do a half bat build with a tonk officer one and one ox to bat. Now you don't have to have any forced science seating, seating on this ship at all. For tanking, I'd still probably still veer towards having lieutenant science, which means overall the build really doesn't change that much besides the fact that the ship has a little bit higher hull and shields and it has an extra tackle console potentially if you want to go much more offensive focus for the ship. In my build I have a lot of consoles that I prefer to have so my build realistically wouldn't change but if you want to go more offensive or the map didn't require as many defensive stuff I can see where the extra tackle console would, would make a difference overall. Um, Commander, Tent Commander Tactical slash Intelligence doesn't really add a ton to, to the build. It makes more of a, a difference again for DPS based playstyles for um, for some of what intel intelligence can really give you. But the extra, the extra mechanics from, from the intelligence stuff for having Commander Intel doesn't really matter too much in current Star Trek Online. Uh, whenever in reference to the, to the other, other flagships, because both the Scimitar and you know the Honesty and and the the Bortosk classes can use um, the flagship set, means that they're going to be great tanks inside of the game. Preparing versus their their best counterparts, the Legendary Odyssey, great starship. But when when compared to this one, it's got a force of tank commander science and one less tactical console. But you do get some cruiser commands, so it is going to be in the same realm. Just you have to work around that losing tank commander science seat, which also means now, if you're someone that doesn't care about cruiser commands, but and are okay with working around the lower power levels, you can argue that the scimitar is going to be a better starship for you, if if you're wanting to do a, a broadside and build, or if you want to do a, a forward firing build, like the scimitar can in some ways be superior to the legendary Odyssey if if you so choose. I still like cruiser commands myself, so I still am going to like the Legendary Odyssey myself, but I do understand that many of y'all would probably prefer the Scimitar over the Odyssey. And that's perfectly fine too. The lagging one, of course, is, is going to be the, the Bortax subclasses. The Martok Tackle Battle Cruiser is the best of those ones with five base tackle consoles. Uh, they're really the only um, cruiser subclass in the game besides frigates that actually has five base tackle consoles without needing miracle worker to boost it up um, and again i've mentioned many times the bortosk line of, of starships needs a legendary version i was surprised that they, that one of these wasn't released during the year of klingon considering captain corn was you know supposed to be the the ideal klingon and she was kind of shafted and pushed to the side during Year of Klingon. I have a theory as to why, but I might get into that in, into it in a different video. Um, now, when you think about the scimitar, um, some other comparisons could be versus the intelligence dreadnought cruisers. And we have the Galaxy X and the Vengeance class. Both these ships have, have, have the similar vein of thought of, of commander intelligence. Just the one has a command seat and the other one has a temporal seat and the Galaxy X is forced to have a Lieutenant Science while the Vengeance is an, is an Ensign Science. So if you're wanting an Ox Bat build, the Vengeance is definitely the clear winner. If you want to do a Half Bat or just use for Tonic Officer, the Galaxy X does have it, it, its advantages as well. That being said, the Vengeance is quite a bit faster and more maneuverable versus the Galaxy X. Um, Galaxy X definitely is more reminiscent of the Dideridex in terms of its maneuverability. But at least is is a five three weapon layout, so you at least don't have that going up up against you. It also has still has the command seating, so in terms of being a still a, a good torque boat, the Galaxy X definitely has that going for it still as well. Also keep in mind, Scimitar is an Intel command as well, so it is another alternative option for a, a torpedo boat as well. 
The vengeance obviously does not have to, does not have a command seating. It is temporal, and it's just lieutenant temporal. So you don't you aren't going to be able to get recursive shearing with with this starship. Um, this was one of the first starships in the game that had this good of flexible seating with lieutenant commander and lieutenant um, universal. For a long time in this game's history, um, most ships are forced to have an engineering seat, a tactical seat, and a science seat. So. If you're someone who just didn't you want to do a full weapons based build and didn't like science abilities and since science was about the best that you could expect from non raiders inside the game the scimitar doesn't have it doesn't have that at all which which is very interesting um i can't recall any other starships in the game that um that aren't raiders that have that have this that have this insane flexibility in, in its seating so that's definitely in, in, interesting to see for sure also of note, um, for the Galaxy X, the wiki is wrong on this. The Galaxy X does not have a built-in cloak. You do have to slot in the, the console in order for the ship to have a cloak. Just going to throw that out there. Okay. Um, now, obviously, as I said, the, the Scimitar is like a, the Juggernaut subclasses because it was like the precursor to them. And here's the base stats for them. When it just comes down to it, it's a bit more maneuverable but it has significantly lower shields than what the other Juggernauts are going to be able to be offering. It's just the differences is that the Vobwar is the, the Merc Worker Juggernaut, the Borg ship is the Command Juggernaut, and the Scimitar is our Intel Juggernaut-esque starship now. And, and again, for the differences is that the, the Scimitar has a Battle Cloak and Hangar Bay versus the Juggernaut Array of the other two starships. As for some other other starships that I wanted to make note of, um, I really hope at some point in the future that we get a legendary Mogai or Valdor, um, because it is a very maneuverable starship. You know, in the same line of thought that you know what the like the Defiant is. Now it's decent maneuverable, um, and it's a commander tackle starship as well. So I hope it, it does get to get the love that it deserves at some point, especially with the Scimitar now being released. I think this ship could receive a legendary treatment at some point in the future too. Now, when it comes to raw flexibility, of course, a lot of DPS captains prefer the Maquis Raider because it is Commander Tactical Miracle Worker with all universal seating from there. And with seven tactical consoles, as long as you can handle the Raider flanking of enemies, especially in like IAC and HSC, and with how enemies are always in their exact spots, it's easy to work, work around where the Raider flanking positions are. The Maki Raider is, is a great starship for that with high, with high maneuverability and high flexibility. That said, if you're okay with just having one Lieutenant Commander in Engineering, which realistically you probably are going to do on the Maki Raider anyway, in practice, the build is the, the raw build from just plain regular bridge off your scene is going to be similar. But again, of course, the Maki Raider has Commander Tactical Miracle Worker, which does add to some extra stuff that you can, you can do for weapons based builds for. Um, for that as well, besides the extra tackle console that this ship is going to be able to get. Now, versus some other older torpedo ships, we have the, Le the Le legendary Talis, which which we we did get earlier. Keep in mind the cloaks between the Scimitar and the Talis are different. Um, the Talis has a built-in enhanced battle cloak, so without needing any consoles equipped whatsoever, it can fire torpedoes from cloak. With the legendary Scimitar, on, on the other hand. I've always I've always called it a scimitar battle cloak, which is actually kind of funny because the blog actually says a scimitar battle cloak now. I've said it so much that the devs actually decided to call it a scimitar battle cloak. Yes. All right. Anyway, um, what's special about the scimitar with this battle cloak is if you equip a console, you can fire any weapon from cloak instead of just torpedoes. Now, if you don't have the console equipped, it's just a regular battle cloak, but it has the potential to do more with its battle cloak. Additionally, you've got another console that you can equip that lets you keep your shields up while cloaked as well, which is nice. It, it reduces some of the risk of going in and, in and out of cloak. Now, the the Voth have an also have, have an alternative method of just having lots of resistances. The Scimitar just at least gets to keep its its shields up, which is nice. Um, its, its secondary shields console is garbage, but you see, you you, you can forget that one. But um, the other two consoles are definitely fun to use. Um, and also with the comparisons of bridge after seating, it, it is also a just like the Talis, it's a tact, it, it's tactical intel and a lieutenant commander command. 
the Tlis does have a force loose hang pair assigned seat. So if if you're if you don't like that and are willing to sacrifice the maneuverability for more flexibility, you are probably going to like the scimitar more than the than the Tlis. It's also important to compare the scimitar to to the Star Trek Picard um, striking warbird as well, which does have a little bit lower durability for much higher flexibility and still getting that that hangar bay. So when it comes to torpedo builds, the Stripling Warbird from loot boxes is not going to be a terrible option either. And it's just flipped instead of Intel Command, it's Command Intel, which I would say is a superior superior choice overall. Um, and this is another starship which doesn't have any foresight and seating either. So it is very much a comparable starship from a one-to-one -one ratio. Just that you don't get any of the fancy stuff that a Simder has access to and no access to, to the flagship console set either. And lastly, I'm just going to include the two classic Strike Wing Escorts at the end as well here, um, in case y'all are curious. They both have, have command seating as well for torpedo stuff, in case y'all are, are curious about that. With that said, let's get into the traits and consoles. We'll go over the old stuff first, and then we'll get into the new stuff. Now, as for the old stuff from the Didard X, most of the stuff was terrible. They did mention on the 10, 10 Ford Weekly um, stream that they were going to buff some of these consoles a little bit. Protective Singularity and Milker Cohesion Field were both fairly garbage consoles and forgettable consoles. Even Protective Singularity is one that you could you could still get on on the exchange through um, some of the boxes, or at least at some point, at least at one point, you were able to. They might might, might have removed that now as well um, with cross faction access of, of starships. Now the big console by far that was good was the Molecular Phase Inversion Field. It basically was uh, was the Voyager Voyager's a blade of armor console, but less powerful, but usable on much more starships. That being said, because just like the Voyager's blade of armor console, it takes weapons offline. But at the same time, it also gives you it does but it doesn't take the shields offline and gives you lots of shield resistance as well as that bonus damage resistance. So in some ways, it's a little bit better. And useful on more starships, but because of the weapons offline, it's only realistically good on science warbirds because of this restriction on warbirds. Unless they remove that restriction for warbirds, the only ships that it's going to be good for is for warbirds that have a secondary deflector. Which, um, as I've mentioned in, in other videos before, we have very few starships in in the game that have a, that have both a singularity core and a secondary deflector. We have the Solne ships, obviously, which are really really old ships at this point. We have the multi-mission explorer warbirds, which again are older ships, and again no primary specialization on them. And we have our two Romulan fleet um, warbirds that have a secondary deflector. Keep in mind, I am mentioning this here as well. The Sui Moor does not have a singularity core, therefore it does not count as as a warbird. Therefore, it cannot use that console. So that is a downside to that ship. I wish it had a singularity core. So that there is a reason to fly the ship over over the Vern, but you know it is what it is. At some point, hopefully, Cryptic will add a Romulan starship with both a Singularity core, a secondary deflector, and a full specialization. It's been a while since Cryptic has added one of those for the for the Romulan Re Republic. So, so hopefully, Cryptic that does that in the future. Now, as for the Simdar consoles. These are the fun consoles. Um, the secondary shields console is by far the worst of, of the three. You're only going to put that one on if, if you want the three-piece set for the Theron Pulse. You know, the iconic scene from um, Star Trek Insurrection where, um, where, where all, all, the, all the tips of the Simitar you know, fl flies out and the Theron Pulse is about to go out and, and take out the, the Enterprise-y um, Iconic scene never actually goes off because um, Data and, and Picard save the day, but you know, it's it's fine. Um, I wish that you would you were able to move while the fan post was going on. Um, you know, like how the not how the not, not, not cool console works. That, that does a similar theme thing. Um, the two more fun consoles by far is Cloak Barrage, able to fire while cloaked. Keep in mind, um, after after 15 seconds, you lose weapon power. So it's only, only ideal to keep cloaked for 15 seconds. 
Singularity Super Unit lets you keep your shields up while you're firing from Cloak. So there is there is synergy between those two for sure. And if you do want to fly a Simtar for fun, these are definitely consoles that I highly recommend to add for the funsies for, for, for flying. For, ac for actual meta stuff, I, d I don't recommend it. But for fun, it's definitely fun to add, add those to your ship. The more meta stuff by far is, is the flagship console set. Um, and these are great consoles. Now, the Dampening Wave Emitter, I'm going to note, this is not one that I suggest to use. And it's not because it, 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 it's a bad console. It's because it scales with, with, with EPG and aux power. And unfortunately, we don't have any flagships in, in the game yet that also have access to a secondary deflector. A lot of us are hoping that the future Geminar Vanguard flagship that Cryptic has hinted at for since since the Titan came out last year, a lot of us are hoping that that new flagship also has a secondary deflector as well. So that the Dampening Wave Emitter actually has a use for the flagships and, and the flagship set in general. That means that if you're a tank captain, and don't have the Krenum ship for the for the fourth console in the console set. The three piece for the other two for an extra 30% on bonus all damage is is not bad for, for a console, even if the console doesn't really do that much. Besides, you know, the clicky to minus 80% all energy damage for 15 seconds and disable for a few seconds. It's not bad. It just doesn't do a lot for you, frankly, um, other than the actual clicky itself. Uh, Adaptive Emergency Systems is one of our alternatives to the DPRM console for tanking captains when it comes to the survival aspect. There are lots of other consoles that are alternatives to the, to the DPRM for DPS, but for tanking, there really just aren't that many because the, the DPRM not only gives you healing, but also gives you bonus, um, bonus damage resistance as well. And Adaptive Emergency Systems does very close to what the DPRM is going to be able to do. Combine that with the flagship tactical computer and you've pretty much got the DPRM via two consoles. And you can add these with the DPRM for the Scimitar or the Odyssey or the or the Bortosk as well. The two piece gives you an extra crit chance and flight turn rate, which is nice for a starship that actually got buffed on its turn rate for the legendary version. And you know, three, three, three piece gives you a lot of extra bonus damage if you're going to be a tank. If you're a DPS captain, or you're just picking the scimitar because you, you just want to budget DPR for your build, the two piece of the tackling computer and adaptive emergency systems is totally fine. Keep in mind, um, the flagship tackling computer clicky um, goes on a one minute cooldown when anyone else in your team also happens to also have this console and uses it. So, if you're doing a pre-made team for IC that are all flagships. I highly recommend only the tank to take flash tactical, tactical com computer and maybe one other person just so that the tank can still get that three piece bonus. Um, and then, you know, your entire team is still going to benefit from having that clicky up because this is because this is a haste for your entire team, which, which, which is definitely a powerful console not to be over overlooked at all. As for the old traits, if you watched at the 10th anniversary video, you already know what the, all the old traits are. Um, the Enterprise F had these three, and the Enterprise D had this one. Explosive polarity shift and adaptive hold plating are garbage starship traits. There are free starship traits that are better and are more meaningful for, for basically any build than those two there. Supercharged weapons and checkmate are actually decent ones. Supercharged weapons gives you extra crit chance of crit severity if you're doing a seven energy weapon build with one torpedo. If you're doing one of those types of builds, supercharged weapons is a fantastic filler um, starship trait for sure. Checkmate is, is a very solid filler um, um, EPG based trait. Using control abilities gives you extra damage to exotic and projectile damage for 30 seconds. Uh, the, most most the most traditional science build is going to be AOE abilities plus torpedoes, so you don't so that you don't have to worry about weapon based builds at all. At least when it comes to your weapon power levels. So checkmate is great, very synergistic from for the most traditional science builds. Um, so if you're, if you're going to do a build like that, checkmate it still works very well. As for the new traits, um, I feel that they're both very much more thematic than actually going to be meta. 
Although I could see a world where both of these become meta in some degree. Uh, the, these are Dodex, gives you rapid and mini armaments, which is not going to be good on the on the legendary Dodex, but on, on, on other torpedo specific builds, it could be good. Whenever you use tr the Tractor Beam Bridge Officer ability, not any, any Tractor Beam console abilities, but just the Bridge Officer ability itself, Tractor Beam, you get 50% bonus torpedo damage for 10 seconds, and it launches three plasma torpedoes at an en enemy. This is because one of the iconic missions where you first face a, a Dodex, you get hit by three plasma torpedoes pretty early on, and if you don't know what, what's going on and don't destroy the plasma torpedoes, then, well, then you blow up. So this is just a trade to kind of like be thematic towards that. I I, I know that, that STO builds is already theorizing some options to make this meta when combined with, with unconventional systems and a few other things. Um, so we, we will see if this becomes a, a meta trade or not. I am not someone who really dives into the torpedo specific meta inside of this game that is much more for for augie um on his channel and he'll definitely do a build using rapid emitting armas for sure um i mean just like he's probably going to do an accelerated limits build on the dideradex for sure as well he's definitely going to do that when when this battle comes out um beyond that though the re the real interesting trait is is the trait from the stem star called cheese the predator now the tooltip is slightly misleading. What's going on with this is whenever you use an attack pattern, you, you get a whole heal that scales based upon how much maximum HP that you have. This isn't with temporary HP, this isn't with your base HP or your whole modifier. It's based upon how much maximum HP you happen to have when you activate your attack pattern. Additionally, it gives you the ambush bonus whenever you use your attack pattern. Um, the ambush bonus is, is the same bonus that, that you would get if you were cloaked and then you decloak. Now ambush normally lasts just five seconds, but they did note on the stream that any anything that extends the dur the duration of ambush or enhances the the damage from ambush is going to affect this as well. Now because attack pattern beta it can be up every every fifteen seconds and very easily with a a bridge officer you can make ambush last fifteen seconds. They nerfed, they preemptively nerfed this trait so that you can only activate it once every 30 seconds. So that you wouldn't have this up 100% of, of the time with, with just one bridge officer. Now, I, I, I didn't check recently, but I know back in the day you used to be able to stack um, superior infiltrator with, with infiltrator and with basic infiltrator in your build and have like a 22 second duration for, for, for ambush or something like that. Um, or even longer than that. I don't. I haven't tr tested that in a while to know if that is still the case. If it is, then this could get a lot of extra mileage. Whether that's actually better than you know just using SROs in in your bridge off your seating, that's up to the DPS scenes to, to decide on that. If it didn't have that limit on every every, every thirty seconds. This would 100% be a best in slot tanking trait because of the bonus damage and the extra healing that you're getting from the trait. I still think it'll, it'll be an, an, an okay trait. Um, I don't know if it's going to be a top tier trait. The biggest value, in my opinion, though, besides what the D, what the DPSC is probably going to be able to do with this, is that because you're able to get the ambush bonus from an attack pattern, this means you can. This what this basically means is that in practice, you can basically get the decloak bonus on non-cloaking starships. Federation captains for a while, because a lot of Federation captains are, are a majority of the player base and they're, and they're entitled. They've been wanting to have, have a cloak available to them for, for their non-cloaking Federation starships. And guess what? Now you can add a starship trait and now you can get the bonuses of, of, of a cloak every 30 seconds. I think this, this is a great compromise o o overall. At least for those play styles, it still is going to make it so that, at least unless it's just something I'm, I'm overlooking with with the starship trait, it still means that cloaking starships will be able to use this better because of the reduced clo cloak cooldown. Um, additionally, on on the starship trait, it's still better for cloaking starships, but at least gives a pseudo type of cloak to non cloaking starships too. So, it's it's definitely a good starship trait, whether it's meta. That's going to be up to the, the DPS scene to, to figure out for sure. 
Now, as for TLDR and TLD, TLDDW, we are getting a new legendary Romulan Warbird bundle. It's, it still has the record of 12k Zen price like they're, that they put out for most legendary bundles nowadays that aren't big legendary bundles. It's only 35% off instead of 50% off because there's two legendary starships in there. And then they want to charge you more for having two starships instead of just one. And that's un understandable. As for the two starships, the legendary Dideridex is, a, is our first Merc Worker plus Temporal starship that's actually full Merc Worker plus Lieutenant Commander Temporal. Which is interesting, it'll let you to do Exterior Limits plus Recursive Shearing, all in, in the same build. The downside of, of the ship is because it's one Lieutenant Commander Tactical Seat is forced to be Temporal at, at the moment. It means its only real advantage is, is exceeding rated limits based builds. If you're not doing that, it's basically just a reskin science Merc Worker Warbird. And there are better ships than that inside of the game. So, but I but I do un, un, understand if you're someone who doesn't have you know a, a tier 4 fleet military for you know the fleet of Dar Daredex and just want to fly eight to Daredex. Or you just like the looks of the, the Daredex over the Sea Storm Merc Worker Warbirds, I can understand why you might want to, to get this bundle to fly it. But at least from a min-maxing standpoint, or at least for, for comparable pricings, there are better options to get instead. As for the legendary scimitar, um, it is it is an Intel ship. Um, alongside its its old Lieutenant Commander Command, it got Commander Intel, which is generally speaking the weakest um, full specialization inside the game. That being said, it's still thematic for what the ship is doing. It has a much higher base stats and more um, universal seating. It has three universal seats on it instead of just two, like most good starships nowadays typically have. So if you're wanting, to, wanting a more flexible but slower legendary to list with, with a hangar bay, this is a decent starship for that. And you can do, now do a full ox to bat build on the legendary scimitar versus the old scimitars, which had to do a half bat or just use full photonic officer. It's, it's new trait essentially gives a cloak for any starship in the game when it comes to damage. Um, that also gives a tiny healer scales off of maximum HP. That being said, when you're comparing the legendary scimitar to the old tier six scimitars, sure, it's got a little bit more HP and you've got Intel abilities alongside the, the command abilities. Intel plus command is not a, a unique um, combination. Most legendary starships it happen to be Intel Command. That just is the most popular one that Cryptic has done because it's generally the weakest of, 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 the, of the combinations. Just throwing that out there, which really means unless you care about the Intel or care about the higher stats, generally speaking, any build that you're wanting to make on the legendary, on the legendary scimitar, you can probably make with one of the old tier six scimitars. Unless you're min-maxing, or really, really want that flexible seating, or really want the new skins, or you don't have the old tier six or tier fives and are just wanting to get it all in one sitting, it might be better to skip this bundle entirely. And, and again, as I've mentioned at the very, very beginning of this video, in my opinion, the scimitars, at least the legendary scimitar, is what's carrying this bundle entirely. So if you want the legendary scimitar, feel free to get the, get the bundle. Otherwise, I would recommend skipping the bundle. Cool. All right. Anyway, um, thank you all for um, watching. Please stay safe and healthy during these times. Um, the original video that I was going to release a few days ago just didn't happen. Um, I actually had a neighbor who um, recently passed passed away. They had health complications, and that person did have COVID a couple times. So it probably was a contributing factor to what happened. Got woke up in the middle of the night with firefighters and EMTs and stuff going in into my neighbor's apartment and stuff and after CPR the, the person passed passed away. Um which is which is really sad. Um there is stuff going on right now, not not only with health, but also with with the economy. With all that going on, stay safe and healthy please. And you know, if, if you can't afford the bundle, don't worry about it. Um this is one of those bundles that you know if you can afford it, sure, go ahead and get it. This is one of those bundles that it's not the end of the world if you can't get this bundle. Um, you can get most of what you would be wanting in terms of general performance from other things. It's really just the looks, 
they might be missing on a tiny bit if you don't get the bundle. So don't sweat it too much if, if you can't afford the bundle. Anyway, um, thank you all for watching, and I will see you all in just a few days.